The class seems to be particularly populous today, so, which means the 10 of you who are here are going to get a lot of questions. Now, uh, so uh, the uh, topic we are going to be covering today is uh, we're continuing from last class. How do we draw samples? How, how do we get a network to hallucinate? How does it get imaginative? How does it draw paintings? How does it draw pictures of portraits of landscapes and faces? So the general model that we're going to have before I jump into the lecture is that all of these samples, faces, pictures of faces, pictures of landscapes, they come from some distribution. And so if you want to draw a new landscape, all the network has to do is to draw a sample from this distribution. But then uh, what is this distribution? How do we actually characterize it? These things are obscure things. What is the distribution of a real genuine landscape? We really don't know. So the general hypothesis that we're going to work with is that in some very high dimensional space, like in the, in the space of all uh, images, for instance, landscapes or portraits would actually have some, would, would occupy some portion of the space and have a very specific distribution. So you might have something like, you know, if, if, the, if the space of all pictures were two dimensional, then all portraits might actually lie along this thin line because not every two dimensional uh, collection of pixels is a portrait, right? And specifically that all portraits are going to be some, the distribution of all portraits is going to be some fuzz along some peculiar curve in a low dimensional surface in the space. And now our problem is to find out what the surface is and draw samples from the, from the space, right? So now, how exactly do we characterize this distribution? We don't even know what this distribution is. And so the problem would be to figure out how to learn this distribution and then how to draw samples from it. So the general model we're going to have is some, this technique of reparameterization that we have a Gaussian random variable. And that goes through some function and it generates, uh, and this function takes a sheet and folds it into the shape over here. And if your random variable, if, if you have a Gaussian distribution on the sheet, on the thin sheet, and then fold it, then you're going to end up with a Gaussian distribution on this thin sheet. But then the actual distribution is a fuzz around this sheet. So what we will do is add some noise out here this is your fuzz, and that's the actual data that you're generating. So this is the generative model that we're going to be using, that we start off with a seed distribution, a Gaussian, living in some low-dimensional space, which is the same dimensionality as the surface we're interested in. And uh, when the surface is distorted by a nonlinear non function, then this planar surface sheet is going to become something curved, and your Gaussian is going to become something peculiar on it. And now, if you can learn this function, then easy enough. Every time you want to generate a new landscape, all you will do is draw a random sample from this Gaussian, pass it through this function, and what pops out is going to be a landscape. That's the general, and, and if you learn it properly, that surface and the Gaussian together will capture exactly the distribution of landscapes. The problem is how do you learn this stuff? And so the way we learn it is you're going to start off with a collection of landscapes. And for the collection of landscapes, you have the actual landscape, but you do not know what the z that went into this peculiar function is. If you knew the x and the z, you could estimate the f. And then once you've learned the function f, then thereafter, every time you want to generate a landscape, you just draw a z, put it through the function that's going to generate a landscape, right? But we don't know this. So our problem now is going to be, how do we estimate this z for any given, given x, such that I can take this xz pair and learn the parameters of my, of my function? And since you don't really have z to begin with, then you're going to have to have something that goes from z, 
from x back to z. So you are going to have to learn a function that draws z, produces the z from the x, then puts the z back through the f and regenerates the x. And the constraint you have on the z is that z is Gaussian. So once you actually, now with this model, then you can start off by, by saying, I'm going to pick up my z from my x, try to make sure my z is Gaussian. Then I'm going to pass the z back through my f. And if I've learned everything properly, these two guys must be the same. Once you've learned it all properly, then thereafter you can sort of get rid of this lower portion of it, of the entire network. And the upper portion is the generator that's going to draw landscapes for you. That concept clear? Right? Now, this is, the idea itself is very simple. But then, here is, it, once you begin working through the math, it actually becomes a lot more complex than this. But the basic idea, this is what I want you to keep in mind. This is all that whole entire problem is. You want to learn a, learn a, a function for this peculiar surface on which all landscapes or all portraits lie. And the idea is that if you draw, if you just uh, sampled some random Gaussian on the surface, not on a sheet, not on a plane, and then added some noise to it, it's going to look like landscapes. And the problem is you don't know the z, so you, and you don't know the x, so you're going to have to estimate the z first, and then you're going to have to estimate f. But then obviously, est the estimating z itself is going to be a noisy process. How do we close the loop properly? And so for that, we're going to start off with today's lecture. This is a continuation of where we were on uh, in the last class. This was on uh, Wednesday. And so this, you will, remember, you will realize, looks a lot like expectation maximization. And EM, remember, what we said was that our problem was to train a generative model using incomplete data. In, so for example, vectors with components missing, or some process where the input of the process was missing, like in the case of drawing uh, mixtures, uh, samples from Gaussian mixtures. And from this, you had to completely learn the probability distribution of the entire data. And so the way we did it was to complete the data by filling in the missing components. And so here's my question for number 31. Who is 31? So what was, how did we complete the data? Uh, randomly sample what? Pardon me? The distribution, which distribution? So who's 21? Who is 21? There is a 21 in class. 21 is missing, okay. Who's 32? Yes. So what was the distribution we sampled from? Um, the rest of the data. Well, uh, there was a f formula for it, right? Could you just say, if I'm going to be filling in that black spot in the first column, could I just sample some arbitrary distribution, or was the distribution dependent on what you saw in the green regions? Uh, the latter. The latter. So what was the co distribution called? We called it the posterior distribution, right? We wanted to sample from P of Y given X. Y was missing. So that was, so you can't just randomly sample this. You've got to say the missing and the observed components have a joint distribution. And then if I, have, uh, if, I want to, if I want to fill in the missing data, I have to draw it from the conditional distribution of the missing components given, given the observed components. And this was kind of important. And so, for example, if all I told you was, if I was estimating Gaussian mixtures, if all I told you was this point, you didn't know which Gaussian it came from. So if you plotted all three Gaussians, you could see the relative heights of the Gaussians at this point. The relative heights of the Gaussians at that point give you the posterior probabilities, the conditional probability of the Gaussian given the observation, which might look something like this. And then you, would actually, you could actually explicitly fill out the data with every value of the, of the missing component in proportion to the probability, or you could just sample, right? And so 
the overall process was to complete the data according to the posterior probabilities, P of missing given the observed, as computed by the current model. And there were two options. You could explicitly consider every possible option of the, every possible value of the missing uh, components in proportion to their frequencies, their, pro their probabilities, and then uh, uh, use the completed data to estimate your parameters, or you could sample the posterior probability distribution. And given the choice between these two, who is 22? Yes. Which of the two would make more sense? So I have two options for mis filling out the missing regions, right? In one, I could fill it out in with every possible value that the missing component could take, except I'm filling it out uh, in proportion, the number of times I use that value is in proportion to its posterior probability. In the other, I just sample from the posterior distribution. Sample would be? Okay, but if you could, then what would you do? You do the first one, right? Wherever it's mathematically tractable to actually do the, to consider every possible value, you would consider every possible value. If that's not mathematically tractable, you're going to sample. So that was the first thing. The other thing we saw in the last class was principal component analysis. I had a reason for starting off with principal component analysis. And the reason for starting off with principal component analysis was PCA was a simplified version of this problem that we just, that I just started off explaining. And so, who is, what's happening here? Who is number seven? So, what was the underlying model for principal component analysis? Divide the data. No, so that's not, we weren't speaking of dividing the data, right? Who is 40? Do we not have 40? Yes. So what was the model behind PCA? Um, Pardon me? Regression. It was regression, but there was something more to it than that. What was it? Was it really regression? Is that what it was, we're talking about over here? Yeah. Uh, the point for the, the participants from the point and the line. So you want to find the, this is not a line, the subspace. Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah. You want to find the subspace such that if every point is projected onto the subspace, the total squared error was minimized. This was the standard de definition of PCA. But then, so you know, you had a collection of data points and you're trying to find the plane such that if you looked at the uh, shadow of the, the distance between the data point and, it, and its shadow on the plane, the squared distance, the total squared distance across all data points was minimized. But then there was also, we also saw that this thing actually represented a generative probability distribution who's 18. Yes, what was it? Okay, who was 23? Yeah, what was it? All right, who's 24? Yes, which one was it? Okay, who does remember? Maxwell, okay, go ahead. You're So, so the assumption that we were making was very similar to this, right? That you started off with a Gaussian. So here, for example, if you had two-dimensional, the subspace is two-dimensional, so you have a two-dimensional Gaussian. You're putting that through a linear transform. And so uh, you draw samples from a Gaussian, put it through a linear transform, and add some noise, and that was PCA, right? So we found that we could actually estimate, perform principal component an analysis iteratively. The assumption here is that uh, you have some, uh, the uh, mathematically we said every data point X was some basis times weight one, basis one of this kind, and these bases fully specified the subspace. You have a collection of data, you had to estimate both the bases and the uh, coordinates, the weights of these bases to sample, generate every single data point. And we saw there was a two-step process where given the bases, given the subspace, you could find the coordinates of the data point, the Zs. So actually, I think I call that W and Z, right? 
how I call this W and Z. So these are my bases, W1, Z1, W2, Z2. So given all of the bases, you could find the coordinates. Then find, using the coordinates, you could find the bases. So basically, this, is good. this goes back to this problem over here. You are trying to draw some Z from a Gaussian, put it through a linear transform, and then you add some noise. That's the principal component model. So what we were saying was that on our subspace, you had some Gaussian distribution. And to generate any data point according to this model, you are sampling a point on the subspace, which was according to a Gaussian distribution on the subspace. And then you are adding some noise to it, which is orthogonal to the subspace to generate every point. And this, if you use this uh, model, you end up with PCA, and specifically, you can also recast it this way, that given the x's, you can find the z's. You can find the coordinates. Given the coordinates, you can find the subspace. And so the whole thing ended up being an expectation maximization solution also, where you're given data points, data vectors, and you're not told which subspace the data vectors, uh, which, what is the principal subspace for the data, and you're not told the coordinates on the subspace for the data. But you know that if you know the subspace, you can find the coordinates. If you know the coordinates, you can find the subspace. So uh, one of these two is missing. And so our idea was the coordinates of the data point on the subspace are missing. So you could start off with an initial guess for the subspace, fill in the coordinates. Given the coordinates, you could go off and fill out the subspace, estimate the subspace, iterate the process, and you're going to learn the entire uh, model. So the generative story for PCA, the reason we're talking about PCA is this. It derives from the fact that the, proje that the projection error is orthogonal to the plane. And so you're saying that we are starting off by drawing some k-dimensional Gaussian. So these are showing the equal probability contours for the Gaussian in my, in my figure. So you have some k-dimensional Gaussian. You put it through a d cross k transform so that it takes this k-dimensional Gaussian and puts it in a d-dimensional space. It's like taking your plane, putting it in some d-dimensional space and stretching and distorting it so that now you have a Gaussian in the full dimensional space and then you add some noise to it and everything is sampled from a Gaussian. So this is the generative story behind PCA. You're drawing z from some standard mean, zero mean unit variance Gaussian putting Z through a transform, and then putting, this is the equivalent of saying I'm, a, I'm taking a Gaussian step on my subspace. And then you're adding noise to it, which is orthogonal to the plane itself, and that generates the point. So the, way, the view here is that A times Z, you start off with this nice isotropic Gaussian, which is k-dimensional. And then when you put it through the linear transform, the linear transform is stretching and skewing the k-dimensional space and putting it in three dimensions. So can you give me a piece of paper maybe? Yeah. This one, thank you. So if you start off, for example, with a two-dimensional Gaussian, your universe is just this two dimensions. And then you're taking a, a drawing Gaussian samples in these two dimensions. And then when you put it through the linear transform, it's taking it and putting it in three dimensions, stretching, stretching it along different axes, and then you, get, you still get a two-dimensional plane, but now it's living in three-dimensional space. And so what was originally a, a nice isotropic Gaussian becomes this skewed Gaussian in three-dimensional space, but it's still along two dimensional, in the, within the two-dimensional plane. And then you take a step at 90 degrees to it to get to your point, yes. The, in going, the Gaussian that's going in is isotropic. You could, you, you could have anything, but isotropic is, if, depend, you know, if you're any going that Gaussian that went in was not isotropic, your transform would change. But you'd still end up with the same plane. So do you just use isotropic for convenience? Yeah, I mean, that's, otherwise you have some more parameters you're just throwing in randomly, that's about it, right? So, and this is the, this is the PCA model. Pretty much everything that you've done in machine learning or any other time, any other problem where you were performing PCA was actually learning this model. Nobody told you this, right? And so what PCA is actually modeling the data as, as having a distribution of this kind, that your data 
actually has a Gaussian distribution. But the Gaussian distribution is a thin disk lying very close to a low dimensional plane. A plane, not a curved surface, right? And so we came up with this generative story which said you're taking a Gaussian step on this plane and then taking a step off the plane and that's generating your data. And so the distribution would look something like that. Thank you. I'll use it again. Now, so everybody clear with me. There's a lot of math over here. I'm, not, I'm just sort of glossing over the math because this math is not particularly relevant. Now, uh, this is, who is 36? 36. There is a 36 here, someone. Missing, okay, I think we got our numbers mixed up. Who's 25? Okay, so we took one step further, we went one step further from PCA itself in the last class, what was that? So uh, we spoke of extending the model. So what, remember, what did we say? Uh, the noise can, uh, can be perpendicular to the plane or just a random. Perfect, plane. right? So we said the PCA model says that the actual data lies on a, subs on, on a plane and the noise is orthogonal to it. But in the, in the real world, noise is not necessarily orthogonal to your data. Like we said, you know, white noise images can actually end up looking like pictures. If you close your eyes in a silent room, you can hear people whispering. So noise doesn't have to be orthogonal to it, so we can get rid of that assumption, right? But before that, so there's a poll. Okay, five seconds, guys. All of these statements were true. Go back and take a look, right? Uh, PCA actually performs maximum likelihood estimate of a generative model for the data. The generative model for PCA is that in order to generate any point, the process first takes a Gaussian step on the principal hyperplane followed by a Gaussian step perpendicular to the hyperplane. It can be iteratively estimated using expectation maximization. And it assumes that the distribution of the data is Gaussian that's centered on the principal hyperplane, right? Now, before I continue, let's go back and uh, take a look at how, Prince, how PCA actually works. This is going to be important, right? So you had a bunch of data in three dimensions, and you were trying to find the principal subspace such that every data point was some perpendicular offset from this principal space, and you were finding the principal subspace such that the total offset was minimum. Now, if you wanted to perform an iterative estimate, what you did was first you started off with some arbitrary estimate for the plane again. So here it is. I have Z. Z is going through A times Z, and this, gener this is generating X to which I'm adding noise, right? This was my model. Now, if I had XZ and if I had X hat, it's trivial for me to estimate A. This is just a standard least squares problem. The problem was that when you actually get the data, all you're getting is X. You don't know X hat, right? and you don't know any of this other thing. But here's the thing, if you knew x hat and you know a, then from x hat you can 
take the inverse of a and get z if I know a and if I know x hat, right? And so, uh, and if I know z and I know x hat, I can estimate it. And if I, know, if I know z and if I know x, I can estimate it. So this is the process that we were doing. The first thing we did was you're given some x, and the first thing you do is to try to find x hat, which is to say, I have some data point. I came up with an initial estimate for the plane. And then I know that the projections are perpendicular to the plane. So therefore, this is x. x hat itself must be the perpendicular drop on the plane. And so you find x hat. And that's because you're, you're, you're assuming that a is known, right? And so now you found x hat for every data point. And once you've got x hat and you know a, then from all of the x hats, you can find the z's. You can find the z for every single x hat because you've taken every point and projected it down on the plane and found the x hat, right? Now I have a collection of z's. And so for, for all the data points, now I have a collection of z's and I have a collection of x's. And I want to try to find the, the a that minimizes this noise. And now I can use my, use my z's and my x's and find the plane that minimizes the noise. And so that's going to give me a new plane of this kind. Maybe it's ro it rotates the plane. And so now I've got a new value for a. But now that I've got a new value for a, I can use that value of a to go back and get x hat from x again, because now I'm making a perpendicular drop for every data point onto the plane and repeating the process, right? Making sense to everybody? It's very straightforward. It's not pictorially, if you actually look at it in pictures, it's not very complicated. Now, we said we can improve on PCA. PCA assumes that the noise is always orthogonal to the data. And we know that this is not true. So, we can generalize the model. This was the last thing that we saw in class last, last week. And the way we would generalize the model is that we would say that the noise that is being added after the transform is full rank. It's not just orthogonal to the plane. And so once you've added full rank noise, the rest of the model stayed the same. Nothing changed. Absolutely nothing changed. The only thing that changed was that we said that the noise is now orthogonal, right? But if you go back and look at this problem over here, once I make noise non-orthogonal, what issue do you see over here at this point? Does anybody want to take a guess? Yeah. Exactly, right? And no, I mean, knowing the A and the X, I can, I can no longer produce a per So I have a plane. I have a data point. This is X. When I said the noise is exactly orthogonal to the plane, this was easy. From the X, I could just say this is X hat. And then I have the x hat for all of the data instances. I can go back and get my z's problem solved, right? But now when my noise is no longer required to be orthogonal to the x, orthogonal to the uh, plane, I cannot tell you what x hat was. And so things become a little more complex. What we will have to do is you know that from this noise, from this guy, the noise is most likely this one because the error is zero mean, right? But you could have actually generated this data point from any of these points, right? So given that you could have generated this data point from any of these points, going back to EM, how would you solve this problem? Who is 10? Who is 10? Somebody's got to be 10. I'm sure we distributed the number. Many of you have, I think there are numbers missing. Who is 37? Okay. So given that there are many possible values for x hat, how would you solve this problem? So here is what you could do, right? You could consider every possible x hat value in proportion to its probability, right? So you would be estimating p of x hat given x, or alternately, P of z given x, because knowing z gives you x, x hat, correct? The uh, relationship is deterministic once you give it, once I give you z. 
And so you're going to, and from this you could either sample the x hat or draw or consider every possible value. And now you're back to the same problem. Once you have the x hat, you can repeat this process. So going from principal component analysis to this linear Gaussian model or factor analysis is just a single additional step. Now you have to consider the fact that the noise could be non-orthogonal. -orthogon and because the noise is non-orthogonal, we've got to do what Fuyu just said. We have to account for the distribution of, the, of possible values on the hyperplane from which the data point might have been generated. And once you do that, you can either sample it or consider everything, and then you're back to the PCA framework. So this is, again, this is what is called a linear Gaussian model. These two models data as being a Gaussian. These two models the data as having a Gaussian distribution very close to a plane. So this is basically an improvement on standard principal component analysis. And everything, uh, the only distinction, uh, difficulty is that because now there's no longer a unique orthogonal projection, estimation becomes a little more challenging, right? So this is this linear Gaussian model. The linear Gaussian model says that uh, it's a generative model for Gaussian data. It says if you've got a bunch of Gaussian data, typically in the real world, data are not completely random. Data are structured. If data were not structured, then the universe would be white noise. We wouldn't exist. We'd be a false spread across all, all, all across the universe. The very fact that you exist means that things are clumped together. There is structure in the world. That, that of all possible realities, we are actually going through just one very, 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 very narrow region of it, right? And so in terms of random data, it means that although you have very high dimensional spaces that the data might live in, the actual data just occupy a very thin region of it. And specifically, linear Gaussian models and PCA assume that the distribution of this data are Gaussian very close to a uh, plane. And the assumption is that the main component, the informative component of the data is on the plane, all the fuzz that is that is off of the plane is just noise. Now, and so you just try to estimate this model, right? So this really works when the data are actually, actually follow this model. But anyway, and so, so uh, this whole process that we just saw, that is just maximum likelihood estimation of the linear Gaussian model. Again, there's a lot of math on the slides. That's because I like to inform you guys through slides and not in class. Uh, we're, we're sort of going over the main concepts over here. But this is the general idea, right? So summarizing linear Gaussian models, principal component analysis being just one case of it. Linear Gaussian models are more models for Gaussian distributions. Specifically, they model the distribution of data as a Gaussian where most of the variation in the data lies close to a linear manifold. And uh, so once you do that, then you can model the, gener the generative model itself can be char characterized as drawing a standard k-dimensional Gaussian, putting it through a linear transform, and adding some noise to it. If the noise is orthogonal to the, uh, the matrix A, then you get PCA. If you let the noise be in any direction at all, then you get the more generalized linear Gaussian models. And these are excellent models for data that actually fit these assumptions. If you actually have Gaussian data in the real world, then we all know that PCA is what is the first thing most people do to actually reduce the dimensionality of your data. If you want to do something better than PCA, then you would be performing factor analysis, right? So, Find the trend. They're all correct. <laughs> 
Okay, <laughs> all right. So guys, let me continue, we run out of time. All of these are true, right? Uh, you obviously found the trend, don't believe it. This is not the trend in all the polls. But you know, factor analysis, linear Gaussian models also model the distribution of the data as Gaussian, centered on a principal hyperplane. The generative model is that in order to generate any point, the process first takes a Gaussian step on the principal hyperplane, and then a Gaussian step off the hyperplane. And the parameters of the distribution are basically the basis for the hyperplane and the uh, covariance of the noise that you, that you add once you step on the hyperplane. And these parameters can be easily estimated if you knew exactly where on the plane each data point was generated from, but this is the information that you don't really have. And so the actual estimation performed iteratively, iteratively completes the data by finding the location on the plane using the location on the plane to estimate the plane, re-estimate the plane, then going back and finding the location on the plane and, go, and so on, right? But then, suppose I'm generating, trying to draw samples like pictures of landscapes. Those don't live on linear manifolds. They just don't, right? Real life is very complex. What I can tell you is that real life data still occupy almost no volume of the space. But what I cannot tell you with 100% guarantee is that they actually live close to some linear manifold in the data, so data space. So in the uh, notion, in the uh, using uh, landscapes as my example, if I took the pixel value vectors for all possible landscapes in say a million pixel images, then they're not filling up the million dimensional space. If you actually plotted the scatter in million dimensions and you had, you know, you were capable of visualizing million dimensions, you'd find that they all live Landscapes live very close to a thin surface, lower dimensional surface in the million dimensional space. Faces would be close to a different surface and so on. And so in, those, in that case, the distribution is really going to be something of this kind, you know, the ugly stuff on top or like the helix. It's not going to be lying close to a linear surface. Now, how do you deal with this problem? So the way we deal with it is we can say that this surface, if I stretched it out, if I just grabbed this curved surface and flattened it, then on the flattened surface, the distribution is Gaussian. So then I can go backwards and say, I have a Gaussian distribution on a flat surface. I'm gonna start off with a Gaussian distribution on a flat surface. And instead of simply picking up the surface and putting it in higher dimensional space, I'm gonna crinkle it and put it up, and put it up in high, higher dimensional space. And then once I do this, then if I want to generate any data point, I can sort of first generate it on the flat surface, then put the data through this crinkling function, then I find this, find data close to the crinkle surface, but then I still will have some noise, some fuzz, and that's going to give me, if I add some fuzz, that's going to give me this function right here, right? That's going to give me this distribution. So this is the uh, model that we will use. So this is what we'll call a nonlinear Gaussian model. The, uh, now you have some random Gaussian being sampled, but this Gaussian is now we being passed through a nonlinear non transformation, f of z. And then once you get a nonlinear, put it through a nonlinear transformation, you're gonna end up with a, a point on this curved surface. It's if the surface were flattened, the distribution would be Gaussian, but then you sort of put it through this distorting function. So now you have a point that's on this curved surface, and the distribution is some distortion of the Gaussian on the curved surface. And then you add noise to it. So this is basically a non-linearization of the linear Gaussian model that we just saw. It's a generalization of principal component analysis that we just saw, where instead of having everything be linear, you're permitting things to be non-linear. So, what is happening is that you'd start off with this distribution z, you put it through a nonlinear function, it warps the input space into some curved manifold in the data space. And so sampled, samples drawn from z are now placed on this manifold, which is, which is, which is produced by uh, this function f, which, which, for, which uh, distorts your sheet, the input space. And now the distribution of x hat which came from passing z through this function is going to follow, roughly follow the distribution of x itself. Meaning regions of x which had higher probability over here are going to map onto regions in this space which have higher probability. Regions which have low probability in 
this input space are going to map onto regions which have low probability in the manifold as well. And to generate any data point, uh, so uh, and to generate any data point, we are going to add uncorrelated full dimensional Gaussian noise to the sample. So the only extra assumption we are making, which could be non unrealistic, is that the noise that gets added, the fuzz that gets added to push the data off the manifold itself is Gaussian. We're going to need that just to make things tractable. Now, you don't, you don't have any reason to believe it. You can actually say that this noise has some other structure that's going to be a generalization of this model itself. You could work out the math and write papers about it. Anyway, so here's what happens. You draw a sample from Z from a uniform Gaussian or, stand, or a standard Gaussian. You transform Z by f of Z. That's going to place it on the curved manifold, somewhere on the curved manifold. And then you add some noise. You draw some more noise, which is in any direction, there's no requirement of orthogonality over here. And orthogonality particularly doesn't make sense in this space. The reason I, we, we went from PCA to linear Gaussian models when I began explaining things is that we wanted to permit noise to be in any direction. And now when you've got crazy surfaces of this kind over, over here, the notion of orthogonality kind of breaks down, right? So you don't want to sort of tie yourself down to orthogonality. I mean, what does it mean to be orthogonal to a point? The direction of orthogonality depends on the point itself, which becomes crazy. So instead, you just say the noise can be any odd thing. It is mathemat it's mathematically convenient to say that the noise is just isotropic. And so you draw some noise, and so you add some noise to this point x hat on the, on the surface, and you're going to get x. And this, of course, can model very complicated distributions of all of these kinds. Any distribution that, be, that may be viewed as lying close to a curved k-dimensional surface in the data space. Or even a linear, even if the, if the data actually lie close to a linear surface, that is covered by this model because that's a special case of a curved surface, right? So this is a generalization of the linear Gaussian model. This is a non-linear Gaussian model. The key requirement over here is we need to know what is the dimensionality of the sheet itself. If you don't know the dimensionality of the sheet, then obviously you're not going to be very good at characterizing it, number one. And number two, you need to know what this function is that distorts this plane and converts it into this crazy surface. If we knew both of these, then we know how to generate data from this distribution. So, the problem is knowing, this, knowing the dimensionality of the surface itself is going to be quite impossible. This is where we begin to take guesses. So I might say, for example, that landscapes live in our million, million pixel images, but they live in, say, some 300-dimensional uh, surface in the million pixel space. That's a guess I'm taking. I could have gone from 300 to 301, and maybe things would change dramatically. I really have no way of knowing that is a guess. And the only way we deal with the fact that we're taking a guess is by hoping that any error we make over there gets handled by this noise. So that's something that's out of, out of scope of optimization. But then, this is something we can control, f. What is this function f? We are going to choose a function f that's cap that is capable of learning the surface of the manifold. And this is where our neural networks come in. f of z is going to be a neural network. That's why we have this whole lecture is in a neural networks class, right? So now, if you want to learn the nonlinear Gaussian model, here's what you would do. You'd be given a collection of just x's. You're not given the corresponding z's. You're just given the collection of x's. And from the x's, you want to estimate the parameters of this function z, which takes a sheet and folds it into something ugly. And also, you want to estimate the covariance of this noise, because this noise is accounting for any errors that you make in guessing the dimensionality of the surface itself, besides capturing the fuzz, right? And so the generative model is that you have a standard Gaussian transformed by f, to which you add noise to produce x. We're going to use maximum likelihood estimates, estimation to estimate both the parameters of f and the covariance of the noise. Now, if you actually 
work it out, let's say somebody actually gave you the z, right? Then if I gave you the z, let's say, who is 26? So if I gave you z over here, and I told you what sample z was drawn to generate any data point, is the final observation x deterministic? You have noise afterwards, right? Even if I give you z, I'm adding noise over here. So the probability distribution of x given z is going to be a Gaussian, right? And specifically, the mean of the Gaussian is simply f of z. The covariance of Gaussian is just the, co the co covariance of the Gaussian is just the covariance of the noise itself, right? So this is easy. If I if somebody gives me z, I can compute p of x given z. If I want to compute the marginal probability of x, then I have to multiply it by p of z, take an integral. This is not going to happen. So this is the same uh, problem that we had with expectation maximization. Anyway, poll three. All right, five seconds, guys. This was easy. Let's see. All of these statements are true again, right? Surprise, surprise. So nonlinear Gaussian models are generative models. They model the distribution of the data as Gaussian distribution distributed, but on a curved and distorted manifold as opposed to a plane. So this is the only difference between what we saw earlier and the nonlinear Gaussian models. So the generative model is that in order to generate any point, the process first takes a Gaussian step, but along this curved surface, and then it adds some noise to it. The parameters of the distribution are the parameters of the function that transform a standard k-dimensional planar surface to this curved manifold, and the covariance of the noise itself. So the actual, what I have not mentioned is that if you actually, that this whole thing can be constructed as an autoencoder and the nonlinear Gaussian model is going to be the decoder component of it. I didn't expect anybody to know this last bit. I was, that last bit was just my way of figuring out how many of you are lying. Because if you just found the pattern and answered yes for everything, then you had no business answering yes for the last guy because I haven't told you this yet. <laughs> anyway, so, so here's, here's how it goes, right? Drawing a sample from a nonlinear Gaussian model is a two-step process. You first draw Z, you transform it, and then, it, and then an E is drawn. We saw something about complete data, right? If I want to estimate everything about this generative, mo generative model, then the complete set of data that I need is all of the intermediate values that the process drew in order to generate any sample. So I would need to know for every x, what was the z that went in and what was the noise that went in, right? So if I, or, or alternately, I need to know the z and I need to know the function f, and then I know everything about the process. But we're going to assume that we don't know e, at the least we want z. And if we want z, we can still try to estimate x, uh, estimate f, and the way we will do it is this. So let's assume for every data point x, you know the z. So basically, remember our, I had a chalk somewhere, right? So our model said that the data actually has a curved surface, lives on a curved surface. Of this kind, right? And so, for every data point, I'm going to assume that 
I not only have the data point, but I also know where on the surface that data point came from. So if I know this, then, then, then I also immediately, if I knew the surface itself, then I also know the noise, right? So let's assume that we know the uh, value z that went into the uh, function f of z for every data instance. And then we will try to estimate, derive the estimation rules for trying to find out what f is and what the covariance of the noise is using z. And this is very easy. This is quite trivial. I know that the probability distribution of x given z is just a Gaussian, where the mean of Gaussian is simply f of z. I know its covariance is the same as the covariance of the noise. So given the entire collection of training data, I can write down the log likelihood of the entire training data in terms of these Gaussians, where the, the mean for every Gaussian is f of z, and the covariance of uh, the, the mean for uh, mean of the Gaussian for every training instance is f of z, and the covariance is just d. So I can write out the log likelihood for the entire training data. And then I can maximize this log likelihood with respect to the parameters of the network itself, as well as the covariance matrix. Not a big deal, this is easily done. So I can just do, so I can just define my loss function if I had z for every data instance. And using the loss function, I can uh, now estimate the parameters of the function and the covariance using gradient descent. The problem is I don't know z, right? So now I have to figure out how to estimate z. The data are incomplete. So for every data instance, I don't know what the z is. So we're going to have to guess z. We want to have, if I have an initial guess for the function f, then basically I have some, so the, we can use the same old trick. I can start off with an initial guess for the function f. For every data instance, I can try to find the location on, on the surface, which, is, uh, uh, which uh, could have generated the data point. And then I can use those locations and go back and try to estimate the function itself and repeat the process. And of course, the way you would actually estimate the z, there are one of two possible ways, right? You can try to use every possible value of z that could have generated the data. Again, remember that the noise is not orthogonal. So there's a whole region on this plane that could have generated the data point. So that's actually a probability distribution. I could consider every one of those values, or I could just sample a value from that distribution, as you mentioned earlier, to, to estimate the z. And then I can repeat the process, right? So the option two is by drawing samples of, from p of z given x. The first option, using every possible value is to be preferred if it's mathematically tractable, otherwise you sample, right? But then here's the problem. In order to compute, so where is my chalk? Yeah. For every data point over here, there are many points on this plane from which the data point could have been generated because the noise is not orthogonal to the plane, right? And so for that, I need p of z given x. If you try to work out the mathematics for p of z given x, it turns out that's going to be very ugly because the function f is nasty in the first place. So do we really want to spend time trying to invert the function f to find out what the probability distribution of z on the plane is or take advantage of the fact that we're actually using neural networks? So this is what we will do. I'm not going to actually use p of z given x. I'm going to approximate it. And I'm going to approximate p of z given x also by a network, number one, right? Number two, the surface is kind of pretty wonky. So if I take any plane, if I just flatten the sheet out and could look at all of the regions on the plane that could have generated a particular data point, that distribution can be anything. It doesn't have to be a Gaussian anymore, right? Because the surface itself can be arbitrarily wonky. We don't know what f looks like. We are going to make an assumption that it's actually Gaussian on the plane. So just to make things tractable. And so our a posteriori distribution of p of z given x is going to be a Gaussian. But the mean and the variance of the Gaussian are clearly dependent on x itself because this point decides the center of this Gaussian and the spread. 
And so the mean and the variance are now going to be estimated using neural networks also. You just throw neural networks everywhere, right? And we're going to use this Q of z, z comma x as our proxy for P of z given x. So here is our overall solution to learn the model. I'm going to initialize f of z given theta, and I'm going to initialize mu and sigma, the, the, the networks that estimate the mean and variance of the posterior probability distribution. Then I'm going to, for every data instance, actually I'd start off by say, uh, initializing the guys, uh, the guys on top, the Q. Then for every data instance, I can, I now have a probability distribution, Q of z comma x, right? Z given x. And uh, I can sample that distribution to find the z for every data instance. Now for every data instance, I have z and x. I can use the z and x to go off and as to update the functions of my parameter f. But then once I have the updated function, the, the parameters for function f, then I can go back and use that to, to update my q function itself. Let's see how we actually do this. So here's the complete pipeline. I'm going to sample z from this distribution. Then I'm going to use the z to estimate theta. But then f is fixed. Once I estimate theta, f is fixed. So then because f is fixed, I can go back and release z. I'm not going to actually use z. And then I can back propagate and try to say what are the values of phi that gives you the closest, that gives me the best chance of reconstructing my x. So first thing. I want to sample z from this Gaussian distribution, right? How do I sample z from this Gaussian distribution? That's easy enough. The, the way of sampling from a Gaussian distribution is well known. If I have an arbitrary Gaussian distribution that I want to sample from, then the way I, I do it through a two-step process. I'm going to first sample from a standard mean Gaussian. So I sample some y from a standard mean, zero mean unit variance Gaussian. Then I'm going to multiply y by the standard deviation of the Gaussian to introduce the right spread. And then I add to this the mean of the Gaussian. And this is going to give me a sample from mean sigma squared, right? So this is how I'd actually do it. So if you look at this, this process is the mean and the sigma are actually fixed. The only variation that you get in drawing any samples is the y, or I think in my slide there I'm calling it epsilon. So this is the process of drawing samples from a Gaussian with some arbitrary parameters. So I'm going to use this term over here. I use a standard reparameterization trick. I will actually first draw an x from a standard Gaussian. No, stand, draw an epsilon from a standard Gaussian, then I multiply it by the square root of the covariance matrix, which is like the standard deviation. Then I add the mean. And so this is going to give me a sample from the Gaussian that I have on top. So this is, this is easy, right? So remember how we did this. To sample a z from this Gaussian distribution, which is on top, I sampled this epsilon, multiplied it by the square root of the covariance matrix and added the mean, right? So going back here, we know how to sample from this Gaussian distribution. Straightforward, nothing fancy. Now, once I have estimated the, so I, let's say I started off with an initial estimate for these guys over here. For these guys over here, I have an initial estimate for my Gaussian for every observation x. So from the Gaussian, I've sampled a z. Now, given the z, for every observation, I have the z and the corresponding x. That's, that, that, that is the output. Using the z and the x, I want to estimate the parameters of f and the noise. That is also easy, right? We just sort of worked this out earlier that given the, uh, that the conditional probability of x given z is a Gaussian, whose mean is simply f of x, f of z, 
and the variance is the Gaussian uh, is the variance of the noise itself. And so, from the up topmost equation, we know the log likelihood of every single data instance because z is given, right? And this is a Gaussian once z is given. And so you can compute the total log likelihood of your entire training data. And then so using the cent the, this uh, loss function, which is the total log likelihood of your entire training data, you can, max you can minimize this or you can maximize the, the log likelihood to estimate the parameters of theta and the variance of the noise. So that is easy. So uh, again, one of the common assumptions is that the variant noise is, you're assuming that you, it's common to assume that the noise is uncorrelated. You have to make some assumptions. So the covariance matrix of the noise is diagonal. That's an assumption we all often make. And so based on these, here is the complete process. If I gave you the initial estimate for these guys, I know how to draw, how to sample Z. If I gave you Z and X, we have the formula for estimating, updating the parameters of the uh, function F itself. Right? There's one last bit left. This guy too must be appropriately estimated, right? You want to get a good estimate of P of Z given X, and you can't just use any odd arbitrary function over here. And so that last bit remains. And that last bit ends up being the most complicated bit portion of, uh, of uh, variational autoencoders. Now observe here that this whole thing is really, uh, now, why am I calling it an autoencoder? Just to give you an idea again, this has still following a very standard autoencoding format. The assumption we made is that Z went through F and generated X hat. from which you got x, right? But then to learn the model, you started from x and you went through the inverse of f or an approximation to it to get an estimate of z. So to train the model, what would you do? To train the model, you're going to start off with your x, put it through the inverse, get some z, then put the z forward back through the original model and if your model is correct, these two guys must be the same, right? So that looks like an autoencoder. You have an encoder, which is generating the z from the x, and then a decoder, which is, which is generating the x from the z. And when the net model goes through the whole, when the data goes through the whole process, the output and input must be very similar. So that's why it's an, it's an autoencoder. The business of variational autoencoder comes because the function that we have over here is not actually the inverse of f, it's an approximation to it. It's what is called a variational overbound, right? So now going back, we want to estimate the parameters of phi using the complete data. Remember that we've already been given the z, right? Because we sampled it earlier. So that ends up being a little more complex. Now recall that the approximation is Gaussian with a mean that's a function of, the, of x and a variance that's also a function of x itself. So to estimate phi, we just want to minimize the error between qz of x, which is the Gaussian approximation, and the actual p of z given x, which we actually want to estimate, but we don't really know, right? So we, just, we want to minimize the error without knowing these guys. And so we're going to define our divergence between qzx and p of z given x and use it to minimize the uh, to use it to and uh, uh, optimize phi to minimize this divergence right typically we're going to use the kullback liable divergence now there's a lot of math over here anybody interested in this math okay no, i'm not interested in it either so i'm going to try to do the whole thing with a little less math right it's still math but not so much now, here's what we had. Assume that you've completed the data using Q of Z, Q of Z, right? Uh, or Q of Z comma X, meaning for every X, you got the mean and the variance of Q, and from that you've sampled X and you've completed the data, right? So for at this point, you have a collection of XZ pairs, 
In fact, you could have, because you're sampling Z from X, you could have generated more than one sample for Z and produced many samples for every X. So that's why I have a superscript J as well to go with it. But I'm, I'm, I'm going to sort of drop this J. And so the Z that you've got is sampled from a distribution that's specific to X. This is something I want you to keep in mind, right? But I'm just generally going to use X, X comma Z as my shorthand. And now we have the complete data. We have filled out the missing value, the Z. And so we're going to use this missing value Z to estimate our model. Now the probability of Z given X according to our model we saw as a log Gaussian, right? But then, so, uh, and the log of P of Z given X is going to be just the summation of the, the, the summation of log P of Z given X for the individual training instances over the entire training data. The approximation of P of Z given X was given by this guy over here, Q. If I take the logs again, is the sum over all training instances of the log of Q. All I'm doing over here is taking the logs to get rid of the multiplication when you want to consider the entire training data. You're working with log likelihoods, right? And so we're going to try to estimate the parameters of Q to minimize the error between log of P of Z given X and Q of X comma Z, right? So this is what we want to minimize. Over all of the completed data, you want to minimize the error between log of Q of z comma x, where phi are the parameters of the network which estimate the mean and the variance, right? And p of z given x as computed using the forward function f. And by Bayes' rule, I can write p of z given x as p of z times p of x given z divided by p of x, right? So this simply says I'm going to be minimizing the error between log of Q of Z comma X minus log of P of Z. Remember Z has been sampled, so you already have Z, right? Minus log of P of X given Z plus P of X. P of X is just the probability of the data itself, overall the probability of X, it's not a func para function of anything. We know how to compute P of X given Z. We know that the P of X given Z is a Gaussian with mean F of X, F of Z, right? So, th so that's not a problem. At this point, we have all the terms we require from this equation. And we could just use that equation to define this loss and minimize it, right? So uh, phi over here influences the parameters of Q, influence Q. They also influence Z because the samples you draw are going to be dependent on Q. And this guy over here is not dependent on phi or z and can be ignored, p of x. So this is what we end up getting, right? We get a, log lo we get a loss function, which is defined entirely in terms of the parameters phi, and we can just minimize this loss function to estimate the parameters of q. Now again, I'm not going through the math, go through the slides, there's nothing particularly complex about it. It's just the concepts that we're trying to cover, right? And now the only issue is how do we complete the data? Now, as it looks, as if you look over here, you're going over all of the completed data, x comma z. And the term you're minimizing is the error, the, the uh, error between log of q and p of z and log of p of x given z, right? Now, I can simply choose the samples. You can just draw samples from Q and just minimize this directly and you're done with it. It's going to be, a, it, it makes life simpler. But then if you want to be a little more precise, remember we said that if where possible, we want to consider every possible value of Z, right? So we're going to do this. Remember, again, when I'm completing the data in my ideal world, I'm considering every possible value of Z. Only when I cannot do this that I'm actually going to draw samples. It turns out that over here, there are two components. One is P of Q minus P of Z. And that one, I can actually, uh, the, the expected value of P of Q minus P of Z is something that I can uh, compute using every possible value of Z. 
the second term, which is p of x given z, is something that doesn't have a closed form, and so I cannot compute it using every possible value of z. So for the first term over here, I can just say that I'm using every possible value of z multiplied by the probability of z itself. So ideally, I'd be using p of z, z given x, but I'm just going to use the approximation p of z. And this guy, this first term, and this second term, I'm just going to compute over the samples. And this first term is simply the KL divergence between Q and P of Z, so which is very simple. And the KL divergence has got a nice closed form. If you actually work out the arithmetic, which I won't, you end up with a closed form which only depends on the variance and the inner product between the mean, the trace of the variance, and the inner product between the mean and a second term. So this again has a nice closed form. And so you can actually compute the KL divergence between Q and P of Z. P of Z, remember, was a standard Gaussian, right? We said that the Z that goes in is always a standard Gaussian. So that's why you can compute this uh, KL divergence. And, this, and so the second term, just working with all of the, skip all the arithmetic, you end up with some nice, with some formulae which actually have a nice closed form. They're not particularly complex. And so here is what we do, the complete training pipeline. I'm going to start off by initializing my Q. I'm going to sample a Z for every training instance X. And then I'm going to use the sampled X to update the parameters of F of Z. So updating the parameters of F of Z is going to just minimize the log likelihood, to maximize the log likelihood of the completed data, which is a Gaussian with the mean f of, f of z, right? And then subsequently, I'm going to estimate phi to minimize this other loss function, which minimizes the error between q and p of z given x. And instead of doing it in a two-step process, observe that this term over here is common to both updating theta and updating phi. I can just merge the two and say there's a single optimization where I simultaneously optimize this function with respect to both theta and phi. So you end up with a single update rule which updates both, computes the derivatives for both the encoder portion of the network and the decoder portion of the network. And then you can just plug this into gradient rule, gradient descent. Now, the math again, the cons, uh, I want to emphasize that these math look complicated, so I'm not going over the math, but the basic concepts were very simple. There was nothing particularly complicated about the whole process. The process was, you didn't know F, you didn't know the Z for every X, so you came up with a, with, with a network to estimate the posterior probability of Z. You sample the posterior probability of Z to generate the Z, then you completed the data, and then you could estimate F. And now that you've estimated F, you can back propagate errors all the way backwards and update the Z itself so that the probability of the specific Z that you've got has been maximized, right? You want to minimize the error between the inverse of F and Q. So that's all you're doing. So what we are doing once again over here is mathematically we've got X, so Q, is, up, is approximating P of Z given X. So you get Z. From this, you get F. And so the first step, you sample Q, you get some Zs. Then using the Zs and Xs, you optimize F. But then once you've updated F, then you can go back and update, update Q to minimize the error between Q and F of Z given X. That's all you're doing, step by step, back and forth, back and forth, right? And that's going to give you, and so this step is optimizing, the, the first step is optimizing the decoder. The second step is optimizing the encoder. You can do both in one step. And now once trained, the actual, you know, the whole business of Q over here was only used to be able to sample, to generate samples of X, to complete the data, so that you could estimate this first portion, right? This was the generative portion of the model. So you can just throw away Q, you don't need Q anymore. 
the queue was just put there to make it possible for you to train models. And now the rest of the function gives you the generator model for x. And, ge and generating data using this part of the model should ideally give us data similar to the training data. So where's the neural network over here? F is the neural network and the function q, which actually estimates the mean and the variance of the Gaussian, approximate Gaussian, both of them are neural networks. So you can just use gradient descent. And so this, again, the decoder is the actual generative model. The encoder is primarily you need it for training. It can also be used to generate the approximate distribution of the latent space Z, conditioned on specific inputs. And Z, the intermediate value, is what we call the latent space representation of the input X itself. So we'll skip this poll, but then here, these are what is true, right? The decoder in a variational auto encoder is a nonlinear Gaussian model, and the NLGM in the variational auto encoder is estimated using EM. The encoder is a module that generates samples of Z needed to complete the data in order to estimate the parameters of the NLGM, right? And the encoder approximate P of, approximates P of Z given X to enable sampling of Z to complete the data. So conceptually, there's nothing complicated over here. There's just a lot of math. Unfortunately, I couldn't avoid showing you the math. I just had to, but then you know, to close it, I'd like, to, I'd like to show you some pictures. VAs are, VAEs are unfortunately strictly generative models. Given Z, you can, you can learn the model and say, okay, you know, train this on landscapes, and then you can say, okay, draw me newer landscapes. And the way you would do it is to sample some random Z, put it through, put it through F, and whatever it generates is probably going to be a landscape. But there's no way of saying, to asking this model, here is this picture, what is the probability that this is a landscape? This doesn't have any mechanism for computing the probability for a given landscape because the only way you could compute that probability is to know, is to know the Z and you don't actually have the Z. You could take a guess by putting it backward, getting, it, getting the latent variable and, compu and computing some numbers, but that's going to be an approximation. It doesn't really give you a way of estimating the probability of any given data instance. It's strictly generative. But then given that, here are the kinds of things you can do. So the upper one is a VAE trained on MNIST data. And once trained on MNIST, all of these things are images actually generated by the VAE by randomly sampling Z and putting it through the, putting it through the function F. And you see what comes out is actually just a pretty clean digit, right? Now, the lower one, this is a VAE trained on faces, and then it's used to generate new faces. And you can see once again that it's actually, once it's properly trained, it's actually generating faces. Now, what you'll observe is that the faces are kind of fuzzy, right? And the reason for the fuzziness is very straightforward. It has to do with the fact that this, what you're showing is x hat, whereas the real life data is x hat plus x, number one. And number two, we don't really know the dimension of z. So when you make an assumption that this noise is isotropic, that assumption is not always valid. So it's not like, that you, it's not like you can generate isotropic noise, add it to these pictures and make them more sharp. Because you started off making an assumption about the dimensionality of the underlying surface itself. And so you have some errors. And so because you're not accounting for the noise properly, these images are going to be kind of fuzzy. That's a problem with variational autoencoders. It's something that uh, we won't have with GANs, which we will see in the next class. But the whole idea itself is pretty cool. And then finally, the latent space Z often captures underlying structure in a very smooth manner. So uh, varying Z continuously in different directions can result in plausible variations in the drawn output. So here, for example, is what happened. This was, uh, I think, two images of the same person where you put one image through Q, you get a value of Z. You put another image through Q, get a different value of Z, draw a line between these two Zs and three different instances of Z in between and pass those through F. And so if you start off with a two images, one image where she's you know, not smiling and the other way she's grinning, you pick an intermediate Z and pass it through the function, it actually gives you a partial smile. Or 
you give it, you take a, the original image and a, and a final z where she's frowning and take an intermediate value of z and pass it through f and you actually get a partial frown. So it's actually doing a pretty good jo job of capturing the underlying manifold for the data itself. Right? So in conclusion, VAEs are simple nonlinear extensions of linear Gaussian models. They're excellent generative models for the distribution of data and there are various extensions like conditional VAEs and such like, which you will encounter in the quiz this week. But they are straightforward extensions where the conditioning variable y, there's an additional conditioning variable y. They've been also been successfully embedded into dynamical systems like Gaussian mixtures, you know, HMMs and such like, we won't get into it. But in every single case, the arithmetic for learning is very simple to what we've got over here. The model is always the same, if I knew the z, then I can learn the function f. So I'm going to try to estimate, learn a function to estimate the posterior probability of z given x, and then learn the whole thing jointly. So we'll stop right here. I'm just barely out of time. Thank you.